Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, your enthusiast guide to the cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. My name's Dominic. My name's John. And I'm Jenna. Giving you a rundown, an episode a week of the show that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season one, episode 12, titled Little Prince, originally debuted on December 14th, 1984. The director of this episode was Alan J. Levi, and this was the only episode that he directed. But before we get started, we like checking and see what's going on in each other's lives. John, how are things going up there in this greater Seattle, Washington area? Things are going good. Just enjoying a nice Sunday afternoon. Nice. It's, you know, it's that time of year. It's nice to have a relaxing weekend. I'm just dreading. I have the great stretch of anniversary, birthday, Halloween, birthday, Thanksgiving, birthday, Christmas. So I'm welcoming the slow time that we have in July and early August. Jenna, how are things going for you in the uh, nerd capital that is San Francisco? I have a bit of a of a problem. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, things are fine. Generally, they're fine. But our cat, uh, she likes to bring gophers into the house. Wait, live gophers? Yeah, so <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> 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 um, if they were has, dead it would be much much less interesting she has she has a real knack i think she they're not always they're so, they're sort of transitioning if you will um she just hasn't decided yet whether she wants them alive or not um, oh. but yeah so we've had them in you know a few different states but the main problem is is that they're live enough to be mobile so we've had instances of like okay we wake up we start getting ready and gopher runs across the the (laughs) front of our bed you know what i mean like that kind of uh, um so we haven't had this problem for a little while now i don't know if dan had just like a stern talking to with the cat or what happened but for whatever reason she hasn't brought one in in a couple months but i did see in cleaning the house this morning some evidence that would suggest that maybe we do have another gopher in the house but i can't find the gopher (laughs) so in the meantime i've now put myself in the back bedroom and i'm just gonna wait it out (laughs) until (laughs) until dan gets home (laughs) and uh yeah. So I sent him a I sent him a text and I said, Well we've either we've either I think we might have a rat and he said, Oh, you know, it's actually it's probably a gopher <laughs> as though that were better news. Um <laughs> Yeah, so I'm just I'm back in our office and, and I'm just gonna wait this one out. Keep hearing the dogs bark it every once living. in a while. Uh hopefully they they take care of the problem. <laughs> That's the other thing, is like living or dead, I'm not going anywhere near it. Yeah, I'm much too sensitive to handle any of this. So, <laughs> well, Jenna's living the real life version of Caddyshack. <laughs> oh, you should see! Like Dan is full blown Bill Murray out with like we've got these these like noise maker stick things that help keep gophers out of our well, yard. Just remember, Jenna, in the spirit of Caddyshack, that you can kill gophers anytime you want to. You don't even it's not even against the law. You could just do it whenever you want to. So. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful with your C4. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, let's get into talking about this week's episode. Like I was saying, it's season one, episode 12, titled Little Prince. This is definitely a feels episode. The you know, there's there's some good police work that's happening here, but not the normal run and gun Sonny Crockett. Uh, So let's get in and let's talk about this episode. All right, guys, again, we have a great Miami Vice opening. The The cold opens for the show are always fantastic. And again, this one is solid. We have great music. We have great action. It's not as long as some of the really long ones that we've seen before, but this one is great. The scene opens. Yeah, it's a nice, good, quick open. Uh, and it's actually probably the somewhat the best police work that I've seen them do on the show so far. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And Trudy, throughout this whole episode, she's key in this whole episode. And right from the beginning, she is solid. Finally, Trudy, heavy episode. Or e- even if it's not heavy, right? She she is the integral part throughout the whole episode. Like we have here in the opening where she's playing like she's a junkie coming down off heroin and looking for someone to, to hook her up on the street. And then later in the episode, you know, she's the one that digs up some information to help start pointing them in the right direction. So she is very important in this episode. What also caught me in this open, though, is that it's the fourth week in a row 
that we have a hooker opening. They in the in the short mm-hmm. montage as you see when the episode opens, they're just highlighting all the sex on the streets of Miami. All I can assume is that prostitution must have been a big problem in Miami at that time because they are definitely uh eating that mule so to speak for how often it comes up as a thing in these episodes it's got to be that it's more than just they use it as a crutch like it's got to be a common theme so that people who are from the south they know like hey that's just the way miami is it's got a hooker problem getting back to the open is we have gina and trudy walking down the street and gina uh, trudy portraying herself as a junkie they they appear to be looking for a fix so. Trudy's doing a great job. Like she, at first, I wasn't sure. It, like I thought, I thought the story was going to be that there was just two people on the street. At first, I didn't realize it was it was the girls or the the ladies. I thought it was. I mean, I like I saw that it was them, but I thought that it was something like Trudy had gotten herself in like way over her head and was actually a junkie that that uh, Gina was trying to like take her back to the precinct or whatever to like clean her up. I didn't realize that they were. Just trying to try to catch someone off guard. Especially what happened last week, right? You know? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, I'm with Dom. I didn't, I didn't realize it was Gina and Trudy right off the bat. I thought that that was just gonna set. That was just two characters we're meeting to set up the uh, episode. And we see them walking. You know, they're stumbling down the street. Trudy lo- looks like she's a heroin junkie coming down looking for a fix. We have great music playing in the background. We have Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And Gina and Trudy quickly find someone who's willing to set them up. His name's Luther, and he takes them back to like a um the a dealer it's a house. crack house yeah 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 it's it's, it's a crack it's, house it's like a crash house yeah exactly and of course the b team so and Z- once again zito and switek they're supposed to be their backup but they're too busy with their thumb up their ass to keep track of where they're going is it that they were having car trouble is that why they couldn't follow them like i was a little i was a little lost on that yeah it looks like they're having he's he's like having trouble starting the van and and that but i mean once again the the main thing is that the squad almost completely screws this up and completely loses gina and trudy as they are being led back to this crash house the so house is full of people luther and the dealer are super they're really pushing that's going to happen you get you know luther is making sexual threats to trudy that once once he gets her shot up what he's going to do to her zito and white tech call in to tubs and crockett to tell them like hey we lost them so tubs and crockett take off and find someone on the street that that they know and like hey where is this house you know they 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 run them down and then force him to tell them where it is that way they can at least try to get there so then we jump back to the crack house and gina and trudy have to pull their guns and announce that they're cops it looks like for a split second it looks like no one's gonna be there for backup that the two ladies are gonna be on their own and is you start to feel like like maybe trudy's gonna have to go through with this maybe she's gonna have to get stuck with the needle so that they, they don't break their cover because they are clearly in o- over their heads they need backup and backup is not there but they decide mm-hmm. to, to pull their guns anyway and when they do that when they say that they're miami vice they pull their guns tubs and crockett just happen to kick in the door right at that moment too timing's perfect Pop in and the drug bus goes down. So, yeah. and this leads to my favorite part, which is the guy jumping out the window. Yeah, they shoot him a couple times, and he just takes off running and he jumps out the window. Yeah, my favorite part of that this whole scene is at the end of this scene, Crockett walks over to the window, looks out, looks back with a look on his face like he's be sick, and he walks over and informs Tubbs. There's no fire escape. <laughs> Basically saying that homeboy just went splat. Yeah, up, up, and away! <laughs> Jumps out the window. <laughs> and again, this opening was great. Like, it was, it was like good police work, high tension. Gina and Trudy did what exactly what they were supposed to do. They were willing to take that risk to bring down this dealer. Place is full of people, so they, it was a great opening. It was high tension too yeah, absolutely oh, i yeah. thought the opening was amazing what was disappointing was everything following the opening <laughs> like I, I really wasn't a fan of this week's episode and i thought that it set itself up so strongly with with the open and then it, it just sort of fell flat not even sort of it definitely fell flat for me <laughs> before they leave there they notice this pretty looking white boy just passed out on one of the sofas and then it cuts to the opening credits when we come back from the credits we're at the precinct and they've that pretty white boy that they found 
sleeping on the sofa. His name is Mark. Mark, what was his last name again? Jorgensen. Jor- yeah, Jorgensen. Junior. His, yeah, Junior. His daddy, Mark Senior, is number 387 on the Forbes Richest 400. He's like a 80s stock shark. He reminded me a lot of the future of the guy from Futurama who's from who gets unfrozen from the 80s who's got bonitis. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, and later in the episode, I can't remember if it's Tubbs or Cro- I think it's Crockett compares him to Robert Vesco. And mm. so, and I had to actually look this up, but Robert Vesco apparently is the 80s version of Bernie Madar. The only difference being that he actually got away with it. He mm. went and spent the rest of his life, well, kind of got away with it. He spent the rest of his life in Costa Rica and then Cuba before eventually being arrested in Cuba for trying to pull the same scams and then dying in prison. So that's why I say kind of got away with it. In this opening, when they come back to the precinct and they're talking to Mark, you know, Crockett, for some reason, you know, and I think that's a trend here with this show is that, and we see it clearly in this episode too, is that Tubbs is great at being a police officer. He's good at procedural, following up on leads. You know, he he catches something in an audio recording late later in this episode. But Crockett has like really good instincts, right? And so in the beginning, he Crockett is really pushing on that he feels like Mark can give them connections to people higher up or mid-level dealers and that so they're interrogating him and it's like a good cop bad cop thing crockett is really pushing on him you know on mark trying to get him to give names and Tubbs is kind of playing the good cop like you know look right we're we're gonna get rid of the charges just give us some names and then and then and then we're gonna let you go as a side note i watch a lot of cop procedural shows I'm always let down by the interrogations in Miami Vice. They are some of the worst cops at interrogating. And maybe that's because, like, cop shows have just gotten so much better as far as the writing goes and stuff that happens in the interrogation rooms. I don't know, but it always seems so fake when they get inside these interrogation rooms. It's all very quick, isn't it? <laughs> it seems like yeah. I think that they, they try to allude to the fact that they've been in there a lot longer and they're only showing like the moment that they crack but it all seems very nah. <laughs> tell, tell us what we yeah, want okay here's all of the information great we'll let you out on Tuesday <laughs> bye uh-huh. yeah I don't know it's just the interrogation seems could be could be better but I mean they, they always go the same way too because they always go with Crockett threatening you want to you know what they do in jail you know, and then Tubbs, like, like, buddy, buddy, like, like, if you just tell us, we'll let you off. Oh, yeah. They have the good cop, bad cop routine down. Crockett is always the bad cop. Tubbs is always the good cop. This was a different scenario where Tub he alludes to later before this scene ends. He's a good cop in this scene because he's actually being a good cop. He doesn't, he, he tells a brief kind of poem about how uptown junkies are the worst ones because they're not, they, all their stuff is internal. It, it's internal mm-hmm. pain that, that they're trying to mask. It's almost as if Tubbs like genuinely feels bad for this uh, rich white kid. Before Mark has a chance to give any names, his dad and his lawyer come in, tell him not to say anything else, and they pull him out. But Crockett's still pushing on that he feels like that Mark can give them, as if they push on him a little bit more, that they can get to these mid-level deals, dealers. And he convinces Castillo to continue to push on for, to go try and find more information from Mark and anyone who he's associated with. So the next scene we go to is at a Ritzy Country Club and Crockett's going to go follow up with Mark. And it's it's like an iconic Miami Vice scene though because it's, they're out playing polo, there's a bunch of rich people, everyone's wearing pink and pastel blues and white pants. You know, there's Rolls Royces parked on the grass. Um, it's a, it's, it's so, what I imagine when it comes, when it, like, when I think of my, M- Miami Vice. Quick question. Polo is a very rich person sport. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a game of polo just break out, you know, at a rec center. What, what, what is the poor version of polo? Is it croquet? Is that the poor version? But, but I like that if, if it is croquet, that polo has a, has to have like a poor version of its poor version. The poor version That's of how polo rich would it be is. Croquet. Poor version of that would be. No, that couldn't be lacrosse, would it? That'd be like yeah. soccer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just keep bringing it up. Less equipment, less equipment. Now we're down to just a ball. You literally only need a ball. This is as low as you can get. 
<laughs> you don't yes. need pads. You don't need a bat. You don't need any plates. It's like, look, like we have a ball. You kick it past that tree. It's your goal. You kick it past that tree. That's our goal. Ready? All right, let's go. Yeah, it's just that's polo seems to be that much of a rich person sport that it's so rich that it has a rich version, a poor rich version of its own sport. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It, this is one of my favorite scenes. There's, there's two, my, my two favorite scenes in this episode is this one and later when they set up the stakeout at the, at the mission. And they're both because of Sonny. He's, Sonny's watching them play polo. He sees his dad. We, we get a sense that Mark Sr. is a real douchebag because he pulls his well, – in the middle of the game, he pulls his son off his horse and he makes like a quip to him and uh it was it was away from the play too so it's like it was almost like if you lit up the punter on a football game right Crockett's mm. watching this and you get a sense for how douchey Mark Sr. is and so after the game Sonny goes up to talk to him and Mark is talking to his I guess is it is his dad involved with Mary or is it just his See, assistant my initial thought was that Mary must have been his like stepmom that was my initial thought is that she she's involved in a relationship with his dad but she's not his biological mom it was my initial thought and is that not the case i don't think so i, I, think, I think mary's actually an assistant to her dad to mark's dad to, to mark senior but she's just around so much that mark jr sees her as like another figure in his life oh. see I, I thought it was a much creepier relationship because i thought that she was his stepmom and that mark jr kind of had a thing for his stepmom well, yeah, that's definitely it. Mark Jr. definitely has a thing for her. So when he goes up and talks to her, you can see maybe it's not, maybe it's being reciprocated. You can't tell if Mary's giving, you know, the same feelings back to Mark Jr. But Mark Jr. definitely has like some sort of Oedipus complex for Mary. Yeah. And that's what I thought they were going for. And then this, so while, uh, while as Mark, the scene continues. Yeah. While Mark Jr. is talking to Mary, Sonny comes up and says hi to Mark. And he says one of my favorite lines where Mark asks him, like, oh, you're here to watch. Like, why, why in the hell are you here? And Crockett says, like, I love watching polo. It's one of my fave raves. And it was like face, <laughs> like face palm moment for me. Like, Sonny, we don't want to make fun of you. But then you say things like fave raves and we have to. You back us into a corner, and we have to make fun of you, Sonny. Nah, I for sure want to make fun of Sonny. I mean, it, when he said it, you can feel the air get sucked out of the scene. It, even Mary and Mark Jr. are like, oh, my God. It's like watching a video of an old person do current dance moves. That's what it felt like. When your boss tries to tries to act hip and tries to say something like, look how cray that is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what it, that's what it felt like. It felt very much like John saying cray. So... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I'm glad I could be the example. Of that. <laughs> you know, the scene didn't really do much other than we get an introduction to Mary, right? And Sonny, I mean, I can't remember exactly how that conversation ends with Mark Jr. What is he there to actually talk to him about? It actually, the scene moves on a little further in which Mark Jr. disappears and Mary finds him on the on their bathroom floor. Yeah, I told after back, the game, all strung back at out. their house. Yeah, they go back to the house, and Mark Junior is he's all yeah. And so I down. think the con- I think the conversation is kind of showing that you know between his dad and then the heat put on by the cops that it leads him to use again, and then we we start to see the relationship with Mark Junior and Mary, the kind of complicated, creepily stepmom stepson but more relationship so i also got the sense throughout this just because of how invested sunny became in mark jr that he just wanted to give him a sense of like yeah i can always be here like i'm i'm just gonna check in and show you how easy it is for me to to be around your day uh, so like don't don't mess up like I just got that sense because like they kind of kept coming back to that where he he gets touchy like later on in the other episode I mean in the episode when they bring Mark around some of the things that he knows is gonna hurt him um, and Sonny gets like really defensive about it so. and in that in that next scene you know where we see Mark all strung out in the bathroom and Mary finds him and then she runs downstairs when Mark Senior comes home she runs downstairs and distracts him like you really get the feeling like. 
Mark sees Mary as like he's attracted to her. Maybe he sees her as a mom, but Mary definitely sees herself as like a motherly figure to Mark Jr. I think that he may have feelings for her in, in kind of a, a creepy way, but she feels more like a parent. And so she like protects him because, I mean, she is surprisingly okay with him being strung out on the floor and you're right she goes downstairs and immediately tries to cover for him with with his dad and so when when we go back to the which by the way mary is mary's probably the most positive drug dealer that we that I've ever seen oh yeah she's like the Avon oh, lady selling, selling heroin yeah yeah I mean uh, and yeah, and sorry Sally to spoil the rest later in the episode but she is incredibly positive about this whole episode all the way until the end up until she sees that like oh I'm gonna die and then that's when if I, that's when you finally realize like she isn't just that smiling nice lady nice older lady that lives next door right well when we we see what Mark Jr's and seniors relationship and how Mary fits into that we go back to the precinct and this is another scene where we see uh, Trudy is a key part in this she's done re- research on the Jorgensons you know he's super rich they have shell companies all over the place they, she says that they they've been investigated by every department IRS DEA FBI, you name the department, they've investigated them. They've always come out clean. There's one company that is like a little loose end that the Jorgensons haven't tied up. And there's like some implication between an Italian actress and some guy that got busted for drugs, whatever. That did, doesn't actually really matter. The important thing was that there is this one loose end. And it was investigated a little bit, but apparently at whatever department investigated it wasn't able to find anything. I feel like Trudy needs a raise because the only time she ever talked, it's always something really, really important for the case. So this one company that is tied to drugs, there is some wiretap evidence that apparently someone went through, but it must not have led to anything. And this time, now we have Tubbs that's listening to that evidence. And like I said, Tubbs is actually, he's a good police officer and he hears in this, in this wiretap, he hears what sounds like a train running. And then he also hears like, then the person who he's working with in this scene, it sounds like what they hear is like church bells in the background. So he's able to narrow down where he thinks that this conversation that was part of this wiretap took place. That's a pretty good job narrowing it down to a section of warehouses. So, I mean, he's, he's got some pretty good ears to figure that out. I mean, there must be a lot of churches and a lot of train stations in Miami. What's amazing for me with Tubbs is that you can see that he's still learning where things are in Miami. So when he says he hears train in church bells, he's kind of work, like leaning on the person who he's wor- wor- working with to tell him where that is. But he's is. I mean, he's got ears. He's able to narrow down exactly where where he needs to be. So we jump from that scene to Tubbs going down to the warehouse that he thinks is it's at. And this is one of my favorite scenes because of the character Seth the dog. This was great. This this from here until the bus. Like it's actually this is when I have the most fun with this episode because he he shows up to this to the train station. You see the train go by. He pays a homeless guy to find out. I don't know what he asked the homeless guy. What does he ask the homeless guy again? I don't know. I I, I don't have. Uh, I couldn't figure that out either. So I I just have notes on when he started talking to the hot dog vendor. Yeah, for some reason I at think... the end of the warehouses, there's this guy set up and he's selling hot dogs and he's got his dog with him. It's like Giuseppe's there selling hot dogs in the warehouse. <laughs> house district right so this is turning out to be a day for tubs talking with giuseppe he finds out about a green van finds out which warehouse he's actually looking for and he gets a hot dog out of the ordeal and you know what's frustrating is that he doesn't even eat the whole hot dog like he throws it in the dumpster right when he gets to the warehouse i'm sure seth the dog would love the rest of that hot dog but credit to the dog right because giuseppe's like didn't we see a green van the dog's like Muff. He's like, yep, it is. It's warehouse number seven, door three. Like, just go right there. That's exactly where that van went. Yeah, hold on. Uh, Death will take you right to the door. <laughs> no, and, and, and this is one of those Miami Vice gray areas too, right? Because Tubbs just goes up to the door and then he picks the lock and goes inside of the warehouse. You would think that they would have learned their lesson in previous episodes about doing this kind of stuff without a warrant because then it turns into evidence that is admissible in court. And it gets better because not only does he find the drugs later sunny and the captain show up too and 
They're like, yeah, let's sit on it. Still no warrant in place. And I, so I don't know how, because this, after Castillo and, and Crockett see all the heroin, you know, $75 million worth of heroin inside of this warehouse, which again, granted the tubs, he's doing good police work outside of the law, but he's doing good police work. They decide to set up, they're going to monitor the warehouse from across the street at this mission, just across the parking lot. Which is going to lead to more stakeout hilarity <laughs> yeah. with the team and... and Email tubs and cock it. <laughs> They're all involved in this stakeout, right? Like the entire Miami Vice is involved with this stakeout, which I, I guess is is accurate because it is seventy five million dollars worth of heroin in this warehouse. Yeah, and my favorite part too is that the warehouse stakeout scene is everyone's involved and they set it to music. Yeah, it's totally a montage because we go back and forth. We go from the, so we start off with my favorite scene of the whole episode. We, when they first get to the mission, they like, yep, you know, Tubbs and Crockett go and like, this room will work. And we have this brief scene where we show Tubbs, he's got a camera and he's slowly putting it onto a tripod. And then it, the camera goes to Crockett and he's got a coffee maker and he's setting it on a chair. He just sets on a chair and he puts his hands up like, oh, that's a coffee maker. <laughs> 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 That's how a coffee maker gets my favorite <laughs> my favorite part of the montage has got to be what i've nicknamed zwitek's masturbating chair we, <laughs> we show up to a scene or the camera it's in front of the half naked woman on the wall yes yeah we show up to to zwitek and his compadre and zwitek is sitting in a chair staring at a poster of a of a scantily clad woman on the wall next to the window and we we see Gina and Trudy enter the room and Zwitek kind of gives them the kind of wink thumbs up like and leaves the poster up for him. And then as the montage continues, we see him changing shifts and we see him once again hanging up the same poster on the same wall, sitting in the same chair. I don't know how Zito and Switek continue to be on the team for the Miami Vice. They don't ever do anything and anything yeah, that they're involved with gets fucked up. What's their value add? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. on a team that like consistently fucks shit up and like ruins everybody's lives, you've got to be pretty bad. <laughs> like, like the bars. They must set be for you like though. they must be like volunteers or something. Like they they <laughs> they don't pay them, so they keep them around. Yeah, they, or hey, that or they enjoy the comic relief that Zito and Switech give them on a regular basis. Like last week with. Switech stand up routine and the other times where they've been they're just a couple of jokers right and they accidentally let witnesses get away and you know, all that kind of stuff they're kind of like the my like if you were to take Izzy and the Noog man and make them Miami Vice that's kind of what Zero yeah. and Switech are yeah except I would mm -mm. much rather have the Noog man on Vice <laughs> <laughs> The, like, let's face it, the Nook Man could have nailed that stand-up routine, oh. and we know it, right? <laughs> well, it also helps that the Nook Man was actually a comedian in real life. Well, that's true. This montage is great, though, because it's, it's a three-way montage. We have the B-team and the ladies. They're rotating back and forth, taking turns, taking pictures of everyone who's going to that warehouse. They have pictures of people throwing their illegally throwing their stuff in the dumpster. There's, like, homeless people going through the dumpster that they're getting pictures of. They have that awkward exchange where Zwitek keeps putting up the naked lady on the wall who they never show Zwitek ever looking through the camera it's always Zito looking through the camera so is there like is, there's another layer to that relationship between Zito and Zwitek and then the third part <laughs> of the don't try to give them dimension okay they're not complex <laughs> they're totally the scenes they're totally there are the scenes of because, because sorry John but they're totally complex because Zito, it definitely there's like there's something between those two where Switek is allowed to do whatever he wants to, and Zito is always just has to put just he's always there to support Switek. And I'll give you an example of that. Remember last week when Switek's doing his stand up routine, Zito was like overly laughing loudly for Switek in the crowd, right? He's not doing it to make fun of him, he's trying to make him feel like people are actually laughing at his jokes. I mean, I and think not... that Zito's just a Switek stand, okay? Like he's just like his number one fan. The two of them are both, yeah, let's very. Let's... Let's not forget about Zito following Zwitek into the bathroom with his mustard sandwich. They have many layers. There is something else going on with Zito and Zwitek. There's, there's another dimension of that relationship. That, which is why I named it Zwitek's masturbating here. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> these two are very comfortable with each other. Well, and so, the third, but the, the third, third layer, but the third layer of this montage is going back to Crockett meeting with who I just call lovingly Marge <laughs> in accounting. <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to figure <laughs> out, trying farm. to chase back this this phantom company name and where it comes from. Wait, have you guys watched uh, Stranger Things? Because she's absolutely a Barb. No, I haven't seen. I haven't started watching that yet. Ah, oh, damn it! I, I haven't either. What? Okay, well, never mind. They, Jenna, your Netflix account only lets two people watch at a time. Me and John can't both watch your Netflix at the same time as you. One of us, only one of us, can watch it at a time. Okay, we have to. We t- watch Stranger. Dan and I watched Stranger Things in like two days. And that was well over a week ago, and that was the only two days that we've been on our Netflix account in months, aside from looking at movies or something that maybe you suggested, or leaving it open for for you guys to be able to go into. Honestly, I am just learning about this Netflix account, and I must find out how to access it. I was not aware that I had that option. <laughs> well, right, back to, well, back to the episode. We have, you know, this eventually pays off. The B team, oh no, it's the ladies are there. The ladies are taking pictures. Trudy sees through the camera, like two limos and a really nice car pull up and a bunch of suits come out and go walk-ins inside of the warehouse. So they radio in, every team comes in. Zito and Zwitex are like having like a fake conversation and walking down the street. They stop, pull guns on the guards that, that are outside of the warehouse. Inside, the there's like, it's, it's de- definitely the drug deal, right? But Mary is the one that's there on behalf of the Jorgensons, and she's the one that's closing this deal. When the buyer goes to leave, they throw open the doors, and the Miami Vice and the Miami Police Department are waiting for him outside. I think there's nothing suspicious about two limos and a Mercedes being parked outside of a warehouse full of drugs. No, not um, at all. Nothing Especially at all. Especially with armed guards standing outside of the door, too. And then number two, once again, Mary is the most optimistic, peppy drug dealer of all i mean here she is being arrested with 150 kilos of cocaine and she is all smiles she and she even gets special treatment right because she doesn't have to go in the paddy wagon back to the precinct she's just riding in the car with tubs and the whole time she's playing dumb saying uh my names weren't on those drugs Going yeah. full well that she's going to end up taking the fall for this. It, you know, you have to love Mary's optimism because you you definitely feel like she thinks that Mark Sr. can get her out of anything. Yeah, and so we are starting to learn the actual dynamic of this family with Mark Sr. running the drugs, Mary runs the day-to-day operation, and then Mark Jr. just uses the drugs and screws things up. Well, what was weird here, right, is that so we see Mark Jr. in the beginning of the episode and in this middle section where they're really trying to bust down the Jorgensons, like he's nowhere to be found. They actually don't use him for any of this uh, any of this information, right? right? Yeah, he's really not involved in the family business. I don't know why. Actually, I don't know why he's a plot point in this story anymore, especially at the end, because he acts like such a baby whenever whenever anyone has a conversation with him. That's what the next scene is, is that we go to the Jorgensen's house. Senior is tell he comes out to tell Junior that Mary's been arrested and he's not going to go help her, which is clearly like I need to make myself I need to give myself separation between what's happening with Mary and I'm going to go tell Junior that she got arrested. That way he gets all angry and goes to try and take care of it himself. Then he can bail her out and stuff like that. And it won't be me that's involved with it. But that's exactly what Junior does. He like hitches up his pants and storms out like I can't wait till I'm 18 and I get out of school and I'm leaving here forever. And he storms out of the house to go to go bail Mary out of jail. And I, I, I think it's funny, too, because Mark Jr., who is more and more, as we find in this next scene, in love with Mary, he's the only one upset about the fact his dad is going to distance himself from Mary. Yeah. Like, she gets in the limo after picking up, after being picked up from the police station, and she's like, no, 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 completely makes sense. He's going to distance himself. You should do the same. You know, and right before we get there, you know, we have a brief scene where Castillo tells the duo, like, hey, you guys are doing a good job. But Crockett's like, yeah, but it feels really lousy. There's a brief scene at the precinct where they're telling Junior, that, like, what his what, what they think his dad is up to, which is selling heroin and marries the middleman. And he doesn't believe it. And again, he just storms out like a baby. 
And then we go to your to, mm-hmm. to the limo scene that you're talking about, where Barry's like all like, no, it's gonna be good. Like your dad will fly me out to like uh, almost like feel like like yeah, he's gonna take me overseas and this will all blow over and everything will be fine. At the end of that limo scene, we see her dropping off Mark Jr. And as she pulls away after telling him everything's going to be fine, we see the doors get locked. And it's kind of Godfather moment, you know, where you almost feel like she's about to say to the driver, like, can you give me one more stance for old time's sake? It finally hits her, right? Like, you think it almost sounds like in the limo conversation, like she's just embracing that she's going to die. But in that where the doors get locked and, and Jesus, I think that's his actual name is Jesus that goes driving away in the limo that, that she's going to get killed now. Like it finally sets in. Yeah. And- like all the way up until that point, she thought he was actually going to fly her out of the country and take care of her. And then the doors lock and it finally sets in like, no, he's just going to eliminate you. Of course, the next scene is exactly that. They find her body underneath an overpass. There, there's, I mean, when you first come in and say it looks like suicide, but it's definitely murder and it's made to look like it was a suicide, like she had jumped to her death. And this is when Mark Jr. comes pulling up as they're pulling the body away and he's distraught and Sonny's, he's had, he lashes out like he's had enough, which was a very odd scene. Remember, they're, un, they're underneath the overpass there and like Castillo, Tubbs, and Crockett are all standing next to each other. There's like this long pause and then all of a sudden Sonny goes, all right, that's it. I can't take this anymore. I feel terrible. We got to go take care of this. He's just like totally out of the blue. He just starts yelling. It almost looked like it was state. They were acting that way to make it look like that's what they were acting for a mark jr i know and it, it, it felt like it was almost almost like captain the captain was setting sunny up to have that reaction too yeah and this is when they they finally go talk to i mean they go to talk to mark jr and mark jr is like i'm ready to do anything this i feel terrible for what happened to mary and this is where we get to the final scene the climax of this episode we go back to the jorgensen house jr is going to go tell is going to go talk to senior he's definitely wearing a wire how the underpass scene closes he's like basically like i'm sunny tells him you're gonna go talk to your dad which means you're gonna go talk to your dad and wear a wire and this is where the feels part is gonna come in and this is actually like the i was the most bored during this scene that i was throughout the whole episode i think this is i think this is the worst part of the episode for me because of how awkward and how just how awkward it is i mean he's clearly got a mic and clearly up to this point mark senior has not involved him in family business and yet all of a sudden the conversation is basically hey dad let's talk about drugs and mark senior all of a sudden gets all introspective and just confesses out- outwardly of being a criminal and a murderer and this is what's supposed to be this is what mark jr has been waiting his whole life for right to see the softer side of his dad for his dad to admit and this is what he does you know he admits like i was too hard on you after your mom died Died, and this is the way my dad was with me. So that I was supposed to cry and supposed to be all business. And then he turns his back to Mark Jr. And you can hear him crying. And that's when Mark Jr. starts to have second thoughts. Like, oh, no, I've made a mistake. Mark Sr. says, I killed Mary. And when he turns around, Mark Jr. just rips open his shirt to show him the wire as like, I'm sorry, Dad, I've betrayed you. And that's when the police come in and arrest Senior. And I think the moral of the story should be that your kids are going to screw everything up. So don't trust them with anything important. No, no. If you're doing some illegal shit like killing people and and dealing heroin, like in every story, not just in Miami Vice, but in mafia movies and everything, don't involve your kids. You're better off if you don't involve them. They're the weak link. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your wife on the other hand oh she's solid she will go to jail for you kids no uh-huh. they just cause problems girlfriends not so much girlfriends are de- 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 definitely a weak link especially if they're a girlfriend on the side that's you got problems like they got they have no reason to protect you and the episode ends there's a brief conversation between Tubbs and crockett where crockett's still unhappy with how things have turned out Tubbs is too but just kind of the nature of their jobs and then we see they go back to the house that night at, to the jorgensen house to see if mark jr has shown up because he just runs off after his dad gets arrested and the staff says that they still that, that they haven't seen him so mark jr is gone and they think that he's gonna go you know they're, they're gonna find him dead overdose somewhere in south beach but we, we really see the final scene in the episode is mark jr hitchhiking which makes sense in some world i guess in some alternate universe him hitchhiking away is gonna make sense no, i think i figured it out mark jr becomes the incredible hulk <laughs> 
he just hitchhikes the rest of his life. He's 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 uh, David Banner. So I don't think it's Bruce Banner in that show in the in the eighties show. It's David Banner is his name. He just he's he he's gonna be David Banner without actually being able to turn into the Hulk. He's gonna be known as Weenie Man, and he's just gonna hitchhike across yes. the country. When anyone tells him something he doesn't like, he's just gonna storm off. He's just gonna cry and storm out. Well, that concludes mm-hmm. our rundown of this episode. Let's uh, let's move on to the music because I hear someone's kind of excited about the music. All right, John, you hyped it up that you're excited about the music in this episode. Tell us all about it. I am excited about the music, and I am actually going to start from the last song and work my way to the first because the first song is the most interesting. So the very last song in the episode during the Warehouse Stakeout is Turn Up the Radio by Autograph. It was released in 1984 on the album Sign In Please. So the band itself is a mix and match guys from other bands. And it, this the song Turn Up the Radio is pretty much their only major hit. What becomes a theme in this episode is that it really didn't take off and hit the top 40 until February 1st of 85, which is about a month after the this episode premiered. The second the second song in the episode is Tiny Demons by Todd Rundgren, who is another guy who is kind of a journeyman musician. He recorded with or produced bands like Grand Funk and worked with Daryl Hall and Meatloaf. And this song actually was released in 81, didn't chart at all. I ran through those very quickly because I wanted to spend most of the segment talking about the song Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And I can admit, I am tangentially aware of music, like the popular music from the 80s. I'm a big fan of classic rock. So bands like Foreigner and Journey, the, the, I know a lot about those types of bands. So like what the, what the Eagles were up to in the 80s and stuff like that. But when it comes to this level, like Frankie Goes to Hollywood, I don't know anything about these bands. Except for the little bit I know that I've caught from my wife, who's a huge fan of this music. Yeah, so this song was their first big hit coming out. And and it was on the record, Welcome to the Pleasure Zone, which is one of my favorite names of a record. Oh, yeah. So it was originally released in the UK in 1983, but really didn't chart in the US until January of 85, and really not till February of 85, similar to Turn Up the Radio a month after this episode aired. But where it really gets interesting is that the band itself was discovered by Trevor Horn of ZT&T Records. And he had this whole idea, him and his partner, of how this was going to be released and how they were going to market it. That they actually recorded three or four different versions of the song and brought in a bunch of different artists to help to record on to these different versions so much so that they actually by the end of recording the only band member lead vocalist holly johnson he's the only one that's actually on the recording itself the rest of the band didn't actually record the song on the album it was recorded by a bunch of artists they put in to record to like help record onto it so interestingly enough so i i'm familiar with this song but only through seeing the frankie says relax t-shirts but way back when i looked into it so i've looked i looked it up again when i heard the song um on this episode but the frankie says relax shirts were in protest to people who called to get it removed off the radio because it was supposedly like the band members were openly gay and that it the song had snm connotations oh yeah and so it was super controversial uh, especially like the music video for it was super controversial and so people wanted it removed but any, anyway yeah so I just, that I thought that, that actually leads me that actually leads me into the marketing side of how they they decided they wanted to market this this song and they were marketing it basically at, on the shock value of the fact that holly johnson and paul Ruther- rutherford two members of the band were openly homosexual when the song was released they actually took out a two-page ad uh, that had a picture. The ad featured Rutherford in a sailor's cap and leather vest and Johnson with a shaved head and wearing rubber gloves with the tagline, All the nice boys love seamen, in all caps. (laughs) 
I love, I do love that this is like, you know, this is 30 years ago and they're right in everyone's faces too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And in, on the same ad, it goes on in smaller print, basically stating that Frankie Goes to Hollywood is coming. They take a shot at Duran Duran uh, saying they can lick their, lick the shit off their shoes. Ed's comment about how 19 inches that must be taken. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. I am just wondering, is that still available in poster form? Because that must be one <laughs> hell of an ad. <laughs> but because of this brazen approach to their marketing strategy, the BBC actually tried to ban the song. And the reason I say they tried to ban the song is that they actually did ban it, but TV and radio continued to play it consistently while it was banned. So the BBC said, like, no, you can't play the song, and they just played it anyway. And so eventually, embarrassed, the BBC lifted the ban because no one was paying attention to it anyway. Nice. So apparently, and yeah, this song is considered very controversial, and the lyrics were considered explicit by uh, a lot of radio stations and DJs at the time. Believe it or not, well before Two Live Crew, there was Frankie Goes to Hollywood challenging censors everywhere. John, I have to say, every music segment that we do, I learn something new. Whether or not I remember it next week is a totally different story, but I had no <laughs> idea about this whole Frankie Goes to Hollywood thing and how how it was back then. I plan on buying you that ad poster uh, for <laughs> Christmas, by the way. <laughs> nice. Let's, uh, let's close out this episode and move on to our final thoughts. Jenna, why don't you kick us off this week since you're the naysayer of this episode where we've kind of flipped you and John from last week to this week. What what are your final thoughts on this episode? Um, I mean, I was not a fan of this episode. It had such a strong start and I really did like the open, but I tend to like all of the opens. I think that that's the one thing that they've can, done very consistently well on. Um, the whole episode just really fell flat for me. I don't have much of an interest in the preppy richy rich poor me white boy crime of the world and that's all that this episode was is just a bunch of rich people getting a lot of special privilege talking about their white collar crimes and it was i mean in some instances it's entertaining to me like like with the the boat race episode where it, it's just comical in a very 80s stupid way but it's when i feel like they were trying to take it more serious and i just couldn't with junior and all of his stupid problems i, I was so over him and his pink polo and yeah I, the, the whole episode was just meh for me i'm <laughs> i'm ready to move on for the next episode fun fact i i am horribly uh bad at watching the right episode so i did start watching next week's episode already <laughs> and, and I, I i feel like this is gonna be this is gonna be a good one so that maybe set the bar high and then i saw just how low we could go after <laughs> but <laughs> yeah i'm just i'm looking forward to next week i'm gonna disagree with you jenna in that I feel like this is one of the episodes from Miami Vice that helped shape what is current procedural court dramas. You know, we have the rich kid who's in over his head. We have his dad who's like, you know, super mega drug dealer. We have good police work. There's It kind of had a little bit of everything. It was a feels episode and it was cultural and culturally important for what was happening in the 80s at that time too, where we have a lot of yuppies who were get, getting involved in more serious street drugs and and so it's like it feels like it was a good mix. It, 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 it was an 80s episode and it was it was perfect. I went to encapsulate all of that where we had 80s classic music. We had an 80s classic storyline where it attacked a problem that was with with these rich people who were who were dealing in drugs that were never thought of that would ever make it to that level. We have the perfect Miami Vice of everything's white and pink and and pastel blues and you know it just has the look of Miami Vice and then we have an angry Crockett. And every time we have an angry Crockett is a great episode. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I'm right there with you, Dom. I think this episode has a little bit of everything the open was good. Music is on point. Everyone is involved. You get a little bit of everyone in this episode. And you're right about it's kind of the 
it's essential police procedural storyline. I was really happy with it. I really enjoyed this. I mean, uh, even to the point that the Yusin's house is actually the same house that they filmed Scarface at. So, I mean, even more cultural presence in this episode as well. I really enjoyed it. I thought this was a really good, classic Miami Vice episode. And I'm really hoping that this means that this, this season is going to end strong. Absolutely. You know, we're starting to feel like you know, the end is coming for season one, right? Starting to see the finish line now for season one and be able to get on to season two. So that's going to do it for this week. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe. If you're already subscribing, tell a friend. Tell them to come check out the show. Like we mentioned in the beginning, we're going an episode at a time through Miami Vice. This week was season one, episode 12, titled Little Prince. You can contact us. Email us at gowiththeheat at gmail.com. You can get all three of us on Twitter. You can also find the show on Twitter at Go With the Heat on and on facebook go with the heat and on tumblr if you want to reach out to us i'm at dom corvo jenna is at jenna a barham and john is at corvo underscore john reach out to us talk to us we'd love to talk to you about more about miami vice and i'm sure john would love to talk more about frankie goes to hollywood again thanks for listening and uh, we'll see y'all next week bye everybody relax